But let me take you back in my history when I was that young fella coming out of college. And, and I was fortunate to have two of the best manners, three of the best manners ever with Henry Gardner, Roy Wallace, and John Crouch. And uh, when I got out of college in 1983, Dad had me chart all of the matings. And at that time, I mean, Dad started getting carcass data on all of our cattle starting in 1970. Actually, he'd done some in the 60s, but we've been continuously getting carcass data since 1970. Well, I like to tell groups that I was Mr. Mark Smart Gardner, Mr. Hotshot coming out of a Kansas State University, the world's smartest, this, that, and the other. And I'm, Dad, why are we getting carcass data? This is dumb. You know, they don't pay you. Certified Angus beef, booyah. Nobody pays for that. And, and, I, and my, bear with me on this, but the, the answer to this is, to a certain extent, you may have to get clobbered over the head like I did when I was the kid out of school. You know, it's all fun and games when you're in the classroom. But when you're in the real arena of life and those nuts and bolts and those dollars and cents, you know, and, and I see some young kids that are, that are in that deep enough to be able to appreciate it, but I'm not sure until they actually get that exposure and, and have the chance to make money or lose money, do they really learn it. In 1984, I had identified a bull, or I thought I had identified a bull that did the job better of calving acceptably, early growth, moderate frame cattle. I mean, they were the best cattle, in my opinion, that we'd ever raised. And those cattle, they went on feed at that time at a little over 800 pounds. They were, they were on feed for 98 days. And uh, in this one sire group, there were 44 calves. And in those 44 calves, there were 14 yield grade fours and actually yield grade fives. And uh, the, the other side of that, of those 14, only three of them graded choice. And you would think, well, they just, just did, you fed them too long or you didn't feed them long enough. And the reality of it was there was no right time biologically for those cattle. But the, the really sad thing about that sire was the whole sire group of the 44 head, they didn't all make yield grade fours or five. There were some threes in there. But they graded 30% choice. And these are Angus cattle. And if you put them on a $21 choice select spread, they would have been losing, I mean, instead of having that plus $100 or $175 premium, they actually, a yield grade four select uh, is below par. And, you know, I always like to, to remember back to that. And, you know, and Dad said, you know, you see why we get carcass data? I said, I, I do. He said, how many bulls, how many cows you got bred to that bull? And I, I tell the truth and I say, you know, I have uh, 424, sir. And he said, no, you know, and the reality becomes, I learned that lesson then back in 1980, 85 actually, uh, better because I had created a set of cattle and that, uh, you know, they had some weight, but they had the wrong composition of that weight. And that's no different than what we're talking about in today's world. If we create cattle that have pounds, but the composition of those pounds has no value, let alone added value, added value is probably the only chance that we have of making money. Uh, I mean, if we're just going to be a commodity, I don't care if you're selling widgets or, or cattle. Commodity, there's no money in it. And commodity in general, uh, it's not going to have any profit. You're just going to rise and fall and be at the mercy of the market. You're going to be a price taker instead of a price maker. If we add value, we can be a price maker. We can, you know, I call it a genetic hedge. You know, when we buy customer cattle, I expect those cattle to give us another $100 a head on the grid. And, and that's our hedge uh, uh, to have a chance of making money. I have a good friend on the U.S. Premium Beef Board, Jerry Bone, and uh, I don't think he'd mind me sharing the fact that they, they use risk management. They're one of the greatest feedlots in the United States, uh, have some of the best costs of gains and best feedlot management. They do everything they can to lock in a break even, and their chance at making money is having these value-added cattle that will give them another you know, $75 to $100 plus on the grid. That's their profit margin. And so when you look back to Mr. Mark Smart Gardner that created these cattle that had no chance of grading choice, uh, and you look at that, and, and, and I remember back in 1985 like it was yesterday, in that I've got a whole set of pregnant cows bred to a bull that I hate all of a sudden, 
that doesn't have any value. And if you want to really get critical and think about, okay, you know, we're seed stock producers, you know, and okay, you've got all these sired by this bull that does not fit the industry to add value to your customer's cattle. What do you do with them? Well, we cut them all as we should have. And, and then, you know, what do you do with the females? Well, we can breed our way through it. And, and we did. Fortunately, those were mainly commercial cattle. But if you take uh, cattle and I need to go back, and that sire that we identified, I, he was a great bull for growth. There's no doubt about it. Again, that composition of that growth was not, was not right. We had identified one of the absolute worst bulls of the Angus breed for marbling, one of the absolute bulls of the Angus breed for muscle. He was an extreme negative for marbling. He was an extreme negative for muscle. He was an extreme positive for fat, and we, we smile about that and such, but that's, fat's not all bad on a cow, and we can manage fat, uh, manage the fat endpoint on these feedlot cattle, but there's really no need to select for additional fat, or a, a better way to say it's excessive fat. No marbling, no muscle, big positive on fat, you have the wrong composition, and you have absolutely no chance to make money with those cattle let alone creating a product that a consumer wants. And so I think that probably taught me from day one. My dad liked to tease me about it. Do you make any more of those good cattle out there, cowboy? And I was like, yes, sir, I've been studying. You know, this is what I'm going to do. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you I can do this. And, and I found bulls that added merit. And, and that's what's so interesting, exciting, and even disheartening at the same time. We have bulls that when I was a kid, you didn't dream these could exist. I mean, the bulls of my youth could not, they couldn't even walk in the trail of these bulls. Now granted, these are the descendants of those bulls. And if you as an Angus breeder or you as a cattleman choose not to use cattle with those genetics of merit, you're leaving money on the table. I don't, I don't, you know, if you go to Las Vegas and you get you know, you play blackjack and you're like, boom, 21. Well, boom, 21 with the sire summary, with these bulls that are amazing. You know, Dad and Roy, you know, they were like, you can have a bull that's a 15 on calving ease direct, a minus one and a half birth weight, bottom 5% of the Angus breed for stature, yet in the top percentile of the breed for growth. Oh my God, you can have him be in the top 1% for marbling and muscle. And, and when we use the decision-making indexes, you know, we look at the, the dollar W, dollar weaning for, for value of, of people that are going to sell calves at weaning, which, by the way, guess what? If we have a calving ease bull with moderate stature and, and early growth, he's not only going to excel for dollar weaning, he's going to excel for dollar beef. So if you have a bull like that, you know what Henry and Roy would tell you? By God, you better use him. And Gardner Angus Ranch uses those bulls. And we're out there right now as we speak, breeding 3,500 Angus females to the best bulls of the Angus breed based on data, technology, and information. And those things allow us to create cattle that will make you money.